Richard Scrimger has written 20 books for children, adults, and teens, and his first child children's novel, The Nose from Jupiter, won the Mr. Christie Book Award in 1998. Of Mice and Nutcrackers won the Our Choice Award of the Children's Book Center in 2003. From Charlie's Point of View and Into the Ravine were CLA honor books, and his adult novel, Mystic Rose, was named a Globe and Mail Book of the Year. Uh, his story has been translated into many languages to critical acclaim. Richard has also written articles for Shat Lane, Globe and Mail, Today's Parent, as well as an autobiographical book called Still Life with Children. Um, so you write for so many different ages and in so many different forms. Um, why don't you specialize? <laughs> because I'm easily distracted. Uh, and because my interests are varied and I like to be able to talk to everybody for all the different genres or different styles that I write, whether it's a picture book or an adult novel, I'm really only being me. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I've done some stage work. I'm not a, I, I had a great time. I enjoyed it. It was kind of waiting for Guffman, kind of small town theater. Um, I had a great time. I'm a lousy actor. The only person I can be is me. So every version, every person I play on stage is me. And every book I write is really a book for me. Uh, whether I'm writing a, a book about a about a kid who just doesn't like his, his big sister, or a, a, a dementing old lady talking to God, they're all kind of me. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that's that's very interesting. Um, so your your um, most recent novel, um, Zomboy, is sh is uh, shortlisted for the Red Maple Awards. Um, with the Ontario Library Association. So, of course, I've got my copy here from my... <laughs> and, Wait, uh, is that a library copy? This is the, the library copy from my school. I've already... Look, I've already catalogued it. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. I, I have my own copies of Nose from Jupiter yeah. and Mice and Nutcrackers, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, so how important are awards, do you think? In a way, it, it's, a, it's too bad that we have such a strong award culture. They are important because they do bring people's attention to a book that they might not otherwise see. A book wins an award, so we say, okay, I will pay attention to that book. There are so many books out there. You can't read them all. You rely on reviews. You rely on, on publicity. And awards generate publicity. I have never thought, nor do I now think, of writing as a, you know, an Olympic event. Uh, the idea of being the best writer. The, and very, very often the problem with an award is that it doesn't necessarily go to the best book. Uh, there's a jury, and the jury has to agree on the best book. So very often the book that wins is the book that doesn't offend anybody or the book that they can all live with. <laughs> Sadly, I, I know this is true. I remember a particular um, Governor General's Award a few years back where it was clear to my mind, and I've, done, I've spent my whole life reading, there were two better books than the book that won. One was a clearly girl's book, and one was clearly a boy's book. And I could tell, without ever having sat, sat on the jury, I could tell that they, they'd fought. And one said, I'm not going to let this book win. And the other said, I'm not going to let this book win. So they settled on the third best book. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I sat on juries myself, and mm. there's there a whole lot of interplay among the jurors to decide what you have to give and what you have to take to get the book that you are interested in pushing mm. it forward. I sat on a, on, a, on a jury that was, uh, I wanted to make sure that a funny book won an award, because it's very rare that a funny book wins an award, and I tend to write books that are primarily funny, or at least are funny on the surface, even if they're dark underneath, and I, I think humor is hard to write, and, and it, it doesn't get a lot of respect, so I wanted to make sure that the jury I sat on uh, voted for a book that was, es that was primarily or essentially funny, even if it was a dark as well. Uh, uh, in order to get this book uh, to win the prize, I had to give up on a book that I really liked uh, because the, the other jurors didn't want it on the shortlist. Oh, wow. Um, so there's, there's politics everywhere. When, when I say, you know, how do I feel about that? And that's like complaining about, about, you know, the Canadian government. Yes, it's there and it's not always on your side, but it's the system we've got. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, um... So in Zomboy, you take this really fashionable monster trope of the moment, right? The zombie. And you really give it a twist. So um, I'm just wondering what inspired you to talk about Imre. Well, 
again, when I'm, I, I get an idea and a character first, and then I see where it can go. Um, I like the idea of this sort of sad sack, Eeyore kind of character. Uh, that was the voice that I heard in my head. Uh, if you can imagine Eeyore with a Hungarian accent, that's my voice for Imre. Um, and he's saying, oh, and now this is happening. Now, I just like the idea, zombies can't be, at least I can't write them, to be sexy, the way vampires can be sexy. <laughs> Zombo I mean, bam, uh, zombies, though, can be kind of funny. And I kind of like the idea of funny. I've always liked the idea of writing about the stranger, the guy that does not fit in. All of my characters are, to an extent, a guy who does not fit in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, the, obviously, the zombie is clearly going to be a guy who does not fit in. And what is that going to do to him? Then you ask yourself the sort of the standard fiction question, what if this happened, and then what if that happened, to make his life even harder and harder. And I ended up with uh, a take on the zombie as outsider, the zombie who doesn't fit in at the school, and the sort of person that doesn't fit in at the school before I knew it, I was doing my version of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and I had a school busing story with a zombie as as the black kid being being bused to the white school. Yeah. Uh, I didn't obviously. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go too far down that road. It was an interesting little take on racism, um, which is not my story to tell. But I'm just interested in the other who does not fit in. Mm -hmm. um, one of my I won't say heroes, but I really enjoyed the book. Uh, an American, a New York writer named Colson Whitehead wrote a book called The Intuitionist where he invents two different kinds of elevator inspectors, uh, believe it or not. Um, one is an empiricist and one is an intuitionist. One goes from some, and, and the whole, whole story is, in fact, a very muted, uh, disguised take on racism. His story, he's a black guy, and his, and his stories are often race-based. And this was so cool. I just read it. This is a freaking cool way into the story. That's his story to tell, the race story, I mean, not mine. But I'm interested in pushing the boundaries of outsider, of belonging and not belonging. That's clearly an issue that I care about. Mm -hmm. And you've got another character who's kind of a, an outsider, too. You have Bob, who's a little fragile, a little dweeby. You know, he's... He, he, were you ever worried that um, readers wouldn't like him? He's your main character, right? He's your main character. I'm... What I want my readers to do with my main characters is engage with them. I don't necessarily want them to like the main character. Uh, the book, Me and Death, one of my favorite books, has, of my books, I mean, uh, has a total schmuck as a main character. He does sort of change his mind a little bit, change his heart about halfway through the story, but he's a bad guy. First thing he does in the story is kick a cat, just to show you he's that guy. So Bob is not a traditional hero kind of a guy. He's not the he's not a football player. He's not a handsome, charming George Clooney kind of a guy. Uh, well, neither am I. Um, so I think it's kind of I, I I I wanted certainly I wanted the reader to engage with him. Um, I think again, if we're talking stereotypes or or, or tropes, he's the nerdy, funny guy because he does see things in an odd way. He does see things in a way that makes you laugh. Um, if you could say readers don't like him, you, well, I don't know if that's true. They don't maybe admire him any more than you would admire, let's say, uh, the early Woody Allen character in his movies. You might not admire Woody per se right now, but in his early movies, he was the funny, nerdy guy yeah. who never really got the girl and never really felt happy about it. That's kind of odd. <laughs> <laughs> I I liked him, but uh, I I related to him too well, per perhaps you know, because he's a little fearful and a little, you know, he's the the creative whatever, and uh, his friends are the cool ones, right? Well, uh, I also like the I like the story where the narrator is not necessarily the main dude mm. or, or the coolest dude in the story. Doctor Watson is not the coolest dude in the story. You know, the story is really Sherlock's story. Yeah. Uh, so in the same way. Eve Lowe is cooler as a character mm -hmm. than, than Bob is, and I liked, I liked her a lot, so I just pushed her forward. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, so you have this wonderful character arc going on in a lot of your story, probably all of them, right? I'll admit I haven't read every between single one of your 20 books. Sorry? Between me and my editors, we try 
try to work hard on the character arc. Well, I wondered, um, at what stage of the planning does that come up, or does do you just write it in as you go along? Like, is where where does like do you think of a character arc for the development of your characters? I think in very broad strokes. I think of a character arc in in the way that I could put the entire plot of the book on a recipe card. Mm. So I have a sense of where the character starts and where the character is going to go. Along the way, I always allow myself a moment or a chance to be surprised. And that, to my mind, is the funnest, the coolest part of writing. When you're in the middle of a scene, the middle of a, of a chapter, and you say, oh my god, we could go there. That is so cool. I did not see that happening. <laughs> uh, some, some writers, and very successful writers, um, like to plan every single scene out. I right? like to write a treatment for their story uh, that might be, you know, dozens and dozens of pages long before they write the story. And then the writing of the story is simply filling in the, mm. the, 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 the holes. I like to leave, allow myself room to improvise, room to, to, be, to, to be surprised, honestly. My favorite part of reading is when I am surprised. When the mm. writer surprises me, I say, ha, ah, did not see that coming. That's a cool moment. And I want to do that as a writer as well. I like the initial idea. I like the initial voice or the character that I'm kind of that I'm drawn to. But along the way, I want to be able to say, "Wow, good bit." Hmm. Okay. And and so well, okay, so that that brings me to the end, which is very satisfying, right? I mean, you can't do a zombie novel that doesn't have any horror, suspense, fear, danger, and and the ending is very satisfying because you deliver that. So how what? At what point did that come in? God bless you for being so Canadian. <laughs> my, my previous agent, <laughs> I'll say my previous my agent was is an American. Nice guy, uh, funny, fast-talking guy. But he read the draft of this book and did not like it because he said, it's really funny and it's really scary too. Can't you be one or the other? <laughs> I said, well, actually, I kind of want to be both. What a waste. <laughs> well, if you think about it, and again, I don't want to play. I don't want to play to point fingers. Yeah. Uh, if we're playing broad stroke stereotypes, uh, the American audience that my agent was representing said, "Hey, we want to book this one thing so the reader knows if it's going to be funny, let it be funny." And if you read uh, Percy Jackson's story, it's full of adventure, and mm. Percy's a cool and adventurous and an admirable kind of a guy. Mm. Um, it doesn't change. It doesn't change tack. You don't get a chance to see Percy. Being, being being weak and terrible and sad and angry and pissed mm. off. Mm -hmm. If you read uh, John Green, he's pretty sentimental most of the time. He's, his characters talk a lot uh, and they feel deeply. Um, he tends to be, a, it's a, it's a, I won't say it's one note because that's not fair, John's a good writer, um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a straightforward, like this is what it's about kind of story where I kind of like to surprise myself. Uh, I kind of like to surprise the reader as well. So I wanted a story that was genuinely funny and genuinely scary at the same time. So that bit, the, the last, the, the long last sequence in the, mm. in the, in the zombie book yeah, is, yeah, I wrote it that way from the get-go. I wanted, it's a zombie story. Yeah. So you've got, a, you've got a, a ticking bomb going ready from, from day one, from page one. You've got a ticking bomb. You're waiting for it to go off. And once you introduce the idea of a zombie, it's like Chekhov says, you've got to you introduce a gun in, in Act 1. The gun had better go off by Act 3. Okay. Well, I introduced the, uh, the idea of a zombie, so by Act 3, we've got to have a zombie story. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, so you've got another brand new book out at the same time, I guess? it's uh, This book, this year I have, in fact, three books. Three, three books out this year. Yeah. Oh, okay, so... Uh, talk to me about Vimini Crow's comic book. It sounds experimental, is it? Glad you brought up Vimini Crow's comic book. This was so much fun to write, it almost killed me. It almost killed me, it almost killed Martha Jocelyn, and it almost killed Tara Walker, our editor. This was very much, if you want to call it a labor of love, sure, but the, word, the key word there is labor. <laughs> it was a, it was a, it's a semi-graphic or partly graphic um, mid -gr middle grade novel about two kids who meet at a Comic Con at a convention and fall inside a comic book. It's a sort of a, a very meta that way. They fall inside the uh, comic book that is drawn by the girl's uncle. So they're aware of a front plot because they have to get out of the story and back to the Comic Con because their uncle's now worried about where the girl is. 
and they're also interested in the original plot of the comic book, which they proceed to screw up. As they fall into the comic book, they change the plot. So when they get out, they say, oh my god, we've now wrecked the comic book, and they have to go in and undo all the things that they've done. It's a neat idea, uh, and as we were writing it, Martha and I would go back and forth and say, okay, where are we now? Because there are so many plot lines. The service plot, the original comic book plot, and the screwed up comic book plot. So there are three layers of plot that we have to keep track of at all times. It was messy. A couple of times we honestly had to say, I don't know where we are right now. So, you know, Martha's, Martha's such, a, such a good writer. She's such a, such a, a well-controlled and organized character as well. This bothered her. I'm a naturally disorganized person who doesn't always know what's going on anyway. So I was, you know, my confusion is my natural state. Uh, so I was able to be, you know, navigate comfortably through the story. Okay, that's that's wonderful. So, well, to me, like writing that kind of experimental thing is very literary. Um, can I ask you kind of a general fiction question? I I go to there seems to be this divide between liter literary fiction and genre fiction that does that exist in children's literature what do you think i have trouble with divisions that way uh by me if you want to divide fiction you can say that literary fiction is just another genre of fiction uh and it has its tropes it has its its uh recurring themes and images uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who says, so if you're writing a story and it's got, you know, because the story I was writing at the time had a police scene, and he, and, and, and he says, okay, so you, you bring in guns and drugs and police and stuff like that, that's kind of, that's turning it into genre fiction. Uh, what are you going to do next time? Are you going to bring in drugs and guns and police again? And I said, well, the thing is, these kind of typical go-to plot points are true in all fictions. That's like saying, am I going to write a literary story? Oh my gosh, there's the character with a mental disorder. There's the troubled family. It's just another trouble. You know, there's mom and dad who doesn't, who don't get you. So as far as I'm concerned, the idea of literary fiction, everybody, I think, is trying to write as well as they can, period. It's as simple as that. Uh, you try to make your characters sound like people. You make try to make the dialogue sound real. You try to make the motivations credible. You try to make the pictures interesting. Uh, some people try really hard for poetry. Other people try really hard for direct expression. They can both be literary. Uh, Anne Michaels writes a certain kind of book. Uh, Kutseya writes another kind of book. Kutseya never uses poetry. His words are very straightforward and clean. He's a Nobel Prize winning writer and one of my faves. Um, so the fact that he doesn't write purple prose doesn't, to my mind, take anything away from the quality of his writing. They don't, you know, hand these things out with Cracker Jack box tops. So, I was actually at the OLA conference when you and Eric Walters and Ted Staunton and everybody uh, launched the, um, the, original the, seven the original Seven series. Do you remember the mustaches? <laughs> when yeah, I remember the mustaches. I was in the front row, so I actually got my own mustache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, would you consider that a shared world series? What do you mean by a shared world series? Try well, on. like, okay... What I'm getting at is, okay, you wrote your first book in the, in the, it's actually called Seven the Series, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you wrote your first book for Seven the Series, um, Ink Me, yeah. and now you've done The Wolf and Me, yeah. and I just wondered if there are any special challenges writing something where there's, you know, six other writers on the project. It again is a it's a different experience than usual in that you have to be aware of the shared, uh, that, that's what you mean by the shared world, the, the shared characteristics. I can't invent a, a grandfather that's going to be different from all the other grandfathers. Mm -hmm. Sure. That being said, writing is still a question of you and your screen. You're sitting down there with your computer and it's just you and the, you and the story. You don't want the facts of the story to interfere or to contradict anyone else's facts. So the editor becomes as much a fact checker and a, and a continuity girl <laughs> as, as she is uh, a, a stream of consciousness or, or pro stylist. Um, the books that are most closely linked in that seven series are mine and Ted Staunton. Ted's not just a good writer, he's, a, he's, he's one of my best friends. And we sat down together with a big bottle of something. And 
and came up with a plot that would interact, that would allow both stories to work uh, for the first series. And I wanted to write my particular story uh, from the point of view of a slightly developmentally challenged kid who gets caught up in a game uh, that he doesn't understand. Again, a character who doesn't fit in and doesn't doesn't mind. That's all. All of my themes are this guy, and Bunny is a whole lot like me, in a way that Bob really isn't. Uh, Bob, I mean, I have some aspects of, of Bob the Zombie Slayer in me, in that I am a kind of a, a I cannot help myself from seeing the funny in even if I'm being beaten up. There's a scene where Bob is being bothered by the bully, and he just makes a joke, and, he, and I, I that's exactly how I would do that scene. Um, but I am less like Bob than I am like Bunny, the developmentally challenged kid. Um, maybe our IQs are a little bit different, but just like Bunny, I have no idea what's going on half the time. Just like Bunny, I know I don't fit in. And just like Bunny, I am totally cool with that. Um, and that That's his role. So, I, so the challenge to write the story was to make my character go on an adventure that worked for him. At the same time, he's gonna be in touch with his brother. Ted's writing Bunny's brother character. And we invented a story whereby I got involved with, or Bunny got involved with a gang in the West End of Toronto. And Spencer, Bunny's brother, gets involved with this crazy, dementing old lady in Buffalo, New York, uh, an old film star from the 40s. Uh, and she, without realizing it, gets involved with a gang from Buffalo. And Ted and I said, okay, so the gangs are, they're going to be doing a deal. The gang from, from Buffalo is going to meet uh, the gang from Toronto. And uh, Spencer and Bunny don't ever ever meet because we don't want to give away each other's endings. Uh, so my sto my the Ink Me story ends with this a gun battle in a mall in Toronto, where Spencer's ends up with a crazy showdown in a, in a ghost town uh, in northern Ontario. But the two gangs are involved, and the two characters uh, uh, talk on the phone and text each other all the time to work out what's going on. The new one, The Wolf and Me, uh, is my story where <laughs> Bunny gets kidnapped. That's that's my that's the plot. Ted and I sat down with another bottle of something to to work out a plot that we could we, we could come up with that would serve, serve both stories. And we invented a fictional uh, an East European country that we call Pianvia. And this whole series is predicated around the idea of Grandpa's missing years, the '60s or so. Uh, the kids are at the cottage and they discover a cache, a secret hidden hoard from Grandpa, that involving a whole bunch of passports with different pictures or to, to different names, but the same picture, they're all Grandpa. In other words, Grandpa was maybe working for a bunch of different countries. Maybe Grandpa was, da da da, a spy. And, because uh, he was flying all over the world and running an import-export business. Anyway, so the seven authors decided to dash around and, uh, and unearth spydom, so they would un unfold their own versions of James Bond or whatever it might be. Uh, was Grandpa a good guy? Was maybe he a bad guy? Was he a double agent? Was he a traitor? Oh my gosh, lots of places to go here. And Eric and John and Shane dove right down that particular rabbit hole. Uh, Bunny, he doesn't care. He just wants to go skating. <laughs> he doesn't care what kind of guy Grandpa was. <laughs> so Ted and I sat down and figured what could happen. I wanted a kidnap. So what happened is we invented this country with terrorists. And the terrorists know that Grandpa visited that country and stole something important. They want it back. They put pressure on Spencer, Ted's character to find the thing that Grandpa stole, and they put pressure on him by kidnapping Bunny. Hmm. Bunny is kidnapped from skating at City Hall in Toronto. He's kidnapped with his skates on, and he's thrown into into a <laughs> into a basement that he doesn't know where it is with his skates on. He says, what's going on? They've explained to him. He says, oh, hostage. Right, I'm a hostage. Okay, I understand. So he figures he has to escape, um, and he's going to escape, but always wearing his skates. Fortunately, it's the middle of winter. It's a cold snap. And Bunny decides he's going to skate home. Yeah, I love that part. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's based on, it, it's a combination, I guess, of the John Cheever story, The Swimmer. So Bunny is the skater. He's skating home. Uh, but he's got to run away from all sorts of people who are going to help him, and we're going to get in his way. Meanwhile, Ted is trying to find his brother who he doesn't even know. We didn't, Again, we didn't want to give the plots away, the two stories. So we have, the two, we have two key phone calls uh, at the beginning of the story and at the end of the story. And the way this worked, because I didn't want to give away Ted's ending, and he did not want to give away my ending, the only way this works is both brothers totally misinterpret the situation. So in the first call, uh, then uh, Spencer thinks that Bunny is in trouble, when actually he's just escaped. He's in, he's in better shape than he thinks. And the last call, Spencer says, whew, 
so Bunny's safe. That's great. In fact, Bunny's in way more trouble than Spencer knows. <laughs> Perfect. But it was it was fun writing with with the character with 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 the other seven guys. They're all good guys. We get along really well. Um, to, and as I say, Ted's a Ted's a really good friend. Uh, every now and again, because he write he wrote his story faster than mine, I would need him to bend a little bit. I'd say, Oh, dude, when's your story ending? And he'd say, Sunday, like we decided. Remember? I said, Yeah. Turns out I'm gonna I'm gonna watch to end on Monday. And he got so he said, Damn it, Scringer! I said, Come on. By the day, you're on a road trip to a northern Ontario town. Have a day where they just go driving. So if you read, if you read Ted's first book, there's like chapter 22 begins. So we drove <laughs> and drove and kept driving. He just he found me another day. God bless him. <laughs> That's so nice. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm asking you all these questions partly because I'm a fan, but also because I'm a librarian and uh, also because I'm a what do you call that a hopeful wannabe writer that kind of there thing. Sure. So uh, what I what I wanted to ask you is after you'd written 19 books, was the 20th easier? There's a sense in which I don't want to don't want to slow you down here, but there's a sense in which none of them is easy. There comes a moment in every book where you say, am I going to get through this? Um, and there's a, certainly like doing anything, having done it before makes it easier to be able to say, okay, I've felt this way before. I know this feeling. You know, it's like when you're when you're when you're you know running a marathon. Uh, if you've run marathons before, you say to yourself, okay, here it is, mile 15. I'm starting to slow down a bit. Am I going to make it? But I know I made it last time, so I can do it again. The first time you run the marathon, you say, "Cripes, I'm never going to get through." Oh my God! So the first book is the hard one. Um, okay. Fortunately, that's when you are freshest, so that you have your best ideas. And as anybody will tell you, writing means rewriting. It also involves a little bit of luck. You know, getting the right reader at the right time, the right mentor at the right time. I do some teaching at Humber College. Uh, they have a school for writers there, and I, I do some mentoring there. And I've, uh, many of my students have gone on to become published. Um, sometimes there will be something that turns them about halfway through the course, through, through the program, and they'll say, oh my gosh, I see something now that I didn't see before. That moment, that's what you as a, as a mentor, that's what you as a teacher, that's what you live for, and say, yeah, you got it. And you can also say, because you, I, I read for a living, and I, I, I think about story all the time, I can say to a student, hey, this is a good story. You are not being fair to the story. Pay attention. You know, you, you owe this to the story. I'm, I'm also able to say to, to a student, as, as I wish had been said to me back in my 20s, this story, you know, I don't know. You're a good writer, but I don't know that this is your story. My first book, which never got published, was an entirely fictional universe characters I'd never, I never didn't know anything about, set in a city I didn't know very well. It was clever. There was lots of fun stuff in it, but it wasn't a story. And if somebody had sat me down and said, Richard, darling, this is not going to work. Try another story. My next story that I started, started with one guy who wanted one thing. And it was really simple, point of a pin kind of stuff. And that was the story that ended up getting published. Huh. Okay. So if you are wanting to be a writer, I, you know, my advice is really simple. Write what you know for sure, meaning write what you read. You know, if you write, if you write, or if you write a couple of things, if you read a couple, if you read something that you really like, write a book just like it. Don't be afraid to imitate. Don't copy anybody's words, of course, but don't be afraid to imitate. All art is imitation. And, uh, you know, everybody started out. Every band begins as a cover band. No big band is going to sound exactly like themselves. If you grew up in the 1980s, you probably listened to a lot of. If you were a certain kind of guy, you listened to the Cars a lot, okay? And because they were a cool band, I remember them. They were they, they had some good songs. And you put together a group of yourself, your own, and you try to try to write some songs, and don't they, don't they, son of a gun, don't they sound a whole lot like the Cars? You keep on writing, they still sound a bit like the Cars. You call yourselves the Killers, <laughs> and you end up with a pretty successful career sounding a whole lot like the Cars. I mean, really, that's clearly what they were influenced by. You know, <laughs> the Beatles did not start out to sound like the Beatles. They started to sound like like Muddy Waters, if you were John Lennon. Or, Bill, or 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 um, what's his name? If you with the glasses, uh, Buddy Holly. If you were uh, Paul McCartney, and they found their own sound through through you know imitating. So as a writer, find somebody, find a story you like. If you like Scrimger, find a Scrimger book, 
and find three or four pages or a chapter and try to write a book just like it. You know, do your version of it because you are the only one who can tell your story. I'll just tell my story, but you can tell your story better than I can. And if you take a look at my page, or if it's not me, find a book I care, <laughs> find a real writer that you really admire. Take a look at his or her page. See how much description there is. See how much dialogue there is. See how much action there is. And reproduce that in your writing. How often does he or she break up the dialogue to describe something? You know, how long is it, how often is it straight dialogue? Pay attention and, and imitate. And that's how, that's how writing happens. Yeah, th that's uh, actually rereading Zomboy. Like when I read it the first time, structurally it is super tight. It's super concise. And yeah, like it doesn't read like anybody's first novel. <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 because it was a book, but again, it's a book that caused me some grief. Uh, my agent didn't like that first draft, and I was honestly concerned that I had lost my touch, that I'd lost something. And you might say it's it's so professional and blah blah blah. And it's certainly a better book after after you know editing and publishing or editing and, and rewriting. But that first draft was was had a whole lot of those the of the, of the correct elements in it, and I was totally uh, banjacked. And I said I don't know what to do. So in effect, what I did was I called two friends whose work I admire. Read this and let, just just let me know. It, it, I want you to be honest, I and mean, you're allowed to say yeah, yeah, we really like it. But if there's something that's not working for you, for gosh sake, say so. Yeah. Um, and God bless them. They both turned around. I say Tim Wayne Jones is a good friend. And he came back like two days later and said, oh my God, this is so good. Um, and this may be the, you know, the best thing you've written since whatever. And he was really pleased. Uh, and uh, Ken Opo, one of my best friends, and he said, dude, this is fantastic. I would blurb this book in a heartbeat. Ken doesn't really usually blurb books. So I said, I may hold you to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but their confidence in me meant a lot because up until they got back to me, uh, when they read that first draft, I was, I was saying, geez, I don't know. So... If you're worried because you're doubting yourself as a writer, join the club. All writers doubt themselves. I think that's just that's just a thing. It is rare to have the writer, unless you're a freaking genius. You think of Beethoven. I don't get a sense of Beethoven really doubting himself. When people said, geez, Ludwig, I don't know if that's going to work, he would probably just say, well, I think it is. Shut up. <laughs> um, in a way that Tchaikovsky, let's say, doubted himself all the time. And he would say, oh, that middle movement didn't work for you? I'll, I'll rewrite it. Um, mm. writers, most writers that I know are more like Tchaikovsky than Beethoven. Unless, honestly, I guess if you are a real genius, if you're Alice Munro and you're sitting down there saying, no, this is the story I want to tell, I'll do it my way. Great. Most of us are not Alice Munro. And most of us are just happy to say, to get somebody to agree with us. And we're, we're, we're living with insecurity all the time. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, geez. I, okay. So, um, We've kind of touched on it before, but do you do you think there's a common thread that makes something a Richard Scrimger story? Well, it's going to have some funny in it. Mm -hmm. I say my my last adult novel is a dementing old lady talking to God. She's dying, uh, and yet it's still funny. My novels my novels tend to be funny. I can't really help myself from seeing the odd, quirky side to anything. Mm. So the novel's going to be funny. Underneath the funny, there will be something dark. There's dark under most funny, but under my under my funny, there's always something dark. Even a, a light, fluffy novel like uh, The Nose from Jupiter. Um, we've got a goofy alien, the smart aleck, living inside this boy's nose, which sounds ridiculous, because it is. Uh, but the boy, deep down, has got serious problems. There are bullies on his playground. His parents are divorced in a bad way. They're not doing well with it. There's a girl he likes, and he's not getting anywhere. He's got his problems. Uh, it's a sad book, mm. um, so that I think the the uh, that I like to walk the line between humor and sadness. Uh, I can't help going quirky, weird. I don't go straight funny. I go quirky funny. Uh, in the Seven Writers, uh, it's funny how we all just end up playing to our strengths. So Eric Walters will write a straightforward adventure story. Uh, Ted will write a really funny story. Uh, Satan will go a little dark, uh, John will go a little historical, um, Shane will go a little bit literary, uh, and Nora will go a little bit mysterious. These are, this is, this is who we are. 
Uh, and my book is not not funny the way Ted's is. It's funny, but it's also it's just a little quirky. Uh, my character does not fit in, and he's got some issues. And deep down, the only message that I would ever want to give a reader is there will come a time in your life, maybe there's one right now, where you feel that you are alone, that you don't fit in. That is fine, I want to say. Not fitting in is cool. And all my characters, none of them really fits in, and they're all pretty cool with who they are, because that really is who I am. I was never the, the leader. I was never the captain of the football team. Um, on the other hand, I was never bullied. That was not a thing for me. I did not, you'd think, when, I, when you consider I was nine years old, and I was chubby, and I had thick, thick glasses, and I, 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 I wasn't allowed to wear running shoes, so I wore Oxfords. Uh, I know. Uh, my mom was worried about my insoles or something. Anyway, um, so I, I was this, this, this geeky guy, and the point is I also, I knew all the answers. So you got to figure, the lineup to beat me up would have gone all the way around the block. But it didn't. I never thought that I could be bullied, because I always knew that I didn't fit in, and I was totally cool with that. Hmm. Um, I, I was funny, and I used funny to deflect the bullying and distract. And distraction, as I lo know from being a parent, is the best way to parent. You cannot, you know, you cannot convince your child to do something by force of will. You cannot stop your child from doing something simply by exerting your will upon him. What you can do to the child is distract him. <laughs> <laughs> that worked really well for me and my four kids. Yeah. between distraction and bribery. That would, that would be basically it. And as my kids learned fairly early on, if you can make Dad laugh, you can get away with just about anything. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I just really want to thank you for talking to me today. This was so much fun. And um, I guess, um, do you want to tell people where they can go to find your work? Well, they can go to my website, which is just my name, scrimger.ca. Uh, okay. It's certainly online at Amazon or Chapters, um, and uh, if you go if you go to my website, there's a contact page where you can send me an email, and if you send me an email, I'll write you back. Uh, if you write me a letter, I probably won't because I'm kind of lazy, uh, but email's fast and cheap, um, and I'll be happy to talk to you. I'll be happy if you are a teacher or a librarian, you want me to come to your library or your school, I'll be happy to come and do that too. I travel around a lot. Um, it's what I enjoy doing is talking about story. My talks are never about me. It's not like, hi, this is Richard Scrimger, famous writer, and I'm going to teach you how to, you know, what it's like to be a famous writer. Well, first of all, I'm not famous, but no, this, it, my talks are always about story. In fact, what I've just finished right now is a book about writing. Uh, it's, in effect, it's designed for the teacher or librarian in public or junior high or, 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 or high school, and it walks you through writing a story. I'm not going to rock, walk a kid through writing a novel, but I'm going to talk about where writing yeah. comes from and how you write your, you know, your five or six page story. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a yeah. good idea. Well, What's it called? Well, as of now, it's called <laughs> it's called on writing with an R. No, the, the Stephen Stephen King wrote on, on writing with an R. <laughs> I don't know for sure what that. My guess is the publisher will not let me have that. So I'll I'll think about something else. They'll probably have the lying in the title because lying is an important part of writing. Um, lying. Lying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, that'll come out in a couple of years. I just finished the first draft now. And my editor and I are, are rolling through it. But I just realized I've spent more time reading, I think, than doing anything else in my whole life, sure. uh, including sleeping. Um, I think about story all the time. And I want to, I like to talk to kids. I love identifying with kids. I love talking to kids. So if I'm talking to a, a gym full of grade seven, I'm having a great time. Uh, and I will be talking about story. I'll be talking about where it comes from and how they can build their own story better.